Hello and welcome to the twelfth in this lecture series on understanding science. Today I'm going to cover another very common argument in the arsenal of pseudoscientists, but as with the previous lecture, this actually does lead us into a lot of extremely important material about how science approaches novelty. How should we evaluate new ideas that may go against what we've previously believed? With millions of people worldwide making their living working on the scientific investigation of the universe, this is clearly something that the scientific establishment has had to deal with on a regular basis. But how do we do that without becoming closed-minded? Let's take a look. We should probably start by laying out the whole Galileo gambit in its glory so that you can take a look at the argument we're dealing with here. The setup is simple. Usually the pseudoscientist puts forward their claim. The claim is rejected by mainstream science, and then the pseudoscientist goes on the defensive. Well, science may not be ready to accept my theory, but science also rejected Galileo at first, and it turns out he was right. The implication, of course, is that the same is going to happen with the pseudoscientist's claim at some point in the future. If you recall your high school history of science lessons, Galileo Galilei was attracted to the Copernican system of astronomy, showing that the Earth was not at the centre of the universe, but rather that it orbited the Sun along with the other planets. He was attacked for this belief by the Roman Catholic Church under Pope Urban VIII. He was accused of heresy, forced to recant his views under duress, and then spent the last nine years of his life under house arrest. So, to summarise, Galileo supported a theory that had been proposed by Copernicus, the theory was plausible, backed up with some observational evidence to which Galileo himself added when he discovered that Jupiter had moons that revolved around Jupiter itself, and that therefore not everything in the universe orbited the Earth. Galileo was opposed because the Church didn't like this threat to their beliefs. To be fair, many scientists also opposed Galileo on this point too, but it's very difficult to disentangle any sort of valid scientific opposition from the widespread religious opposition. When you're threatened with torture for believing a theory, it's not too surprising that few people publicly supported it. The simple reason why the Galileo gambit doesn't work is that it's a false analogy. That is to say, the claimant is suggesting that their claim is in the same situation as the work of Galileo, which is almost never the case. Galileo took a theory already supported by some scientists and backed up with theoretical work. He expanded it with a range of observational evidence and published a thoroughly well-argued book on the subject. He showed why his theory was right using proper scientific arguments. He was opposed by the church. It's worth remembering that there really wasn't any other kind of academic establishment at that time. And the opposition was largely based on religious dogma rather than any kind of rigorous logical or empirical argument. So the analogy completely fails to hold, but there's still more to be said. For a start, the number of hypotheses that have been put forward over the centuries is unimaginably large. Only a microscopic, tiny fraction of them ever actually become scientific theories, backed up by sound, analytical and empirical arguments. The vast majority never get that far, and are completely rejected as they fail to find any evidence to support them. Or, more often, the evidence gathered actually shows that the hypothesis simply isn't true. As the inimitable Carl Sagan once wrote, The fact that some geniuses were laughed at does not imply that all who are laughed at are geniuses. They laughed at Columbus, they laughed at Fulton, they laughed at the Wright brothers. But they also laughed at Bozo the Clown. So unpacking the Galileo gambit isn't very hard. It's not difficult to show where the argument fails. What is interesting here is approaching the subject on how science deals with novelty, which we'll get onto next. Just a quick diversion. With all of these claims that the scientific establishment ridiculed and vilified those who put forward new ideas, we have to ask ourselves if it's really true. After all, if someone is claiming that the scientific establishment behaved in a certain way before, it's worth checking if that's actually the case. It doesn't really matter, of course, as the argument is still almost always a false analogy, but we probably ought to think about this for completeness. We've already partly looked at Galileo Galilei, as we saw, Galileo wasn't opposed by the scientific community because there wasn't one, and there was no academia back then either. Science wasn't even a word, let alone a common profession, and pretty much everything was ruled by the Roman Catholic Church. Galileo was partly opposed by his peers, though of course they were also under the threat of arrest and torture if they deviated from the church's dogma, so that doesn't tell us very much. We do know that Copernicus came up with the idea first, and had already convinced quite a few people that his theory was correct. Johannes Kepler, for example, a contemporary of Galileo, used Copernicus's theory to develop his laws of planetary motion in the early 17th century, 
decades before Galileo's arrest. Those laws, still used today, are implicitly heliocentrist, that is, they state that planets orbit the Sun and not the Earth. So Galileo was hardly a radical, he was just stating that he found convincing some views that had been around for quite a while. Let's skip forward a few centuries, and we find the next example sometimes used to illustrate this kind of widespread scientific opposition to novelty. That's Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Darwin's theory is another alleged example of the scientific community opposing novelty. And again, there is a slither of truth to this, but it's worth bearing in mind that Darwin's paper really wasn't faced with the vitriolic hatred that some people like to imagine today. At the end of 1858, which was the year when Darwin presented his and Wallace's work on evolution, the president of the Linnaean Society, Thomas Bell, who actually chaired the meeting in question, said that he wasn't particularly aware of any important papers having been presented that year. Darwin's work was accepted enthusiastically by some people, heavily opposed by others, primarily for religious reasons again, and largely ignored by most. Even amongst the religious, many accepted evolution immediately as the process that their particular god used to bring about the diversity of species that we see today. So there was a lot of opposition to Darwin's ideas, but again we aren't really in the world of widespread academia yet. Science is still only really performed by a small collection of old rich white men at this point in time, the privileged elite, and the techniques of modern scientific investigation are still very much in an immature state. Peer review, for example, is still a century away. So even comparing the treatment of Darwin's ideas to anything that the scientific community might do today is still extremely unhelpful. The last example I wanted to mention here are the theories of Albert Einstein. In 1905, Einstein published four papers that revolutionised most of physics. The best known is the one in which he introduced the idea of special relativity. Again, this is often put forward by pseudoscientists as an idea that was completely ridiculed when it was first published, but in reality the truth is exactly the opposite. Einstein's argumentation was extremely rigorous and mathematical, and those who understood it were more or less obliged to accept the correctness of his ideas, as the derivation was very difficult to oppose. That doesn't mean that they immediately understood all the implications, of course. Yet within five or six years of the publication of Einstein's paper, the majority of physicists accepted the truth of special relativity, and it became part of the core understanding of the physical universe. And remember, before the time of the internet and email, five or six years was a fairly rapid spread of consensus. So with these examples, it appears that the simple caricature of a maverick scientist being widely ridiculed by the scientific community and later proved to be correct isn't as simple or as correct as you might think. For one, the scientific community is a very recent thing. Peer review only really got started in the 1960s, for example, and science wasn't even a word until the mid-1800s. This isn't to say that there was never any persecution or any ridiculing of new ideas that later proved to be correct. Ignaz Semmelweis springs to mind, the man who really pioneered cleanliness in surgical procedures. He was widely reviled by his colleagues. But to compare the situation in history to the way science is performed today seems extremely inaccurate. We're dealing with a completely different situation today, with widespread formalised academic research, peer-reviewed journals, the internet... But just to complete this historical picture, let's look at a few ideas of novelty that were accepted very readily once the required level of evidence was found. My background is in astrophysics, so that's where I get most of my examples from. But it's actually a good source of examples for this topic of novelty, because the science of astronomy is one where human experience is almost entirely invalid. Our understanding of the cosmos relies so much on advanced technology like telescopes and spectroscopes that almost all of the most exciting and dramatic shifts in this subject have come about since the early 1900s. In biology, we sort of knew how animals were put together since prehistory because we'd been cutting them up to eat, and for botany we knew how plants grew since ancient times and have been cultivating them for many thousands of years. But with astronomy, we've been almost entirely ignorant of what goes on in the vast majority of the universe until we had advanced scientific instruments that could peer up above the Earth and measure what was actually going on. I can think of three substantial shifts in our view of the universe as examples from the last century or so, and as far as I can tell, they were all accepted pretty much instantly. The main reason why this happened was that these ideas were all proposed along with a rigorous standard of evidential support. The first shift I can think of is the existence of galaxies. Until about a hundred years ago, everyone presumed that the universe contained just the Milky Way, and that was all that existed. But then in the 1920s, 
American astronomer Edwin Hubble published a study of a group of stars in the constellation Andromeda. He showed that these stars were all at a very large distance from the Earth. In fact, he showed that those stars were in a totally separate galaxy, now known as the Andromeda Galaxy, more than ten times further away than the edges of the Milky Way. This discovery, that we're not in the only galaxy that exists, but one of countless many, not only shook the scientific world, but also the general population. But yet Hubble had backed up his work with the study of a certain class of variable stars, which allowed him to determine these distances with a good level of certainty. One opponent to this idea was the astronomer Harlow Shapley, who, up until this point, had defended the idea that the Milky Way was all there was, as it was the only galaxy that existed, and that the so-called nebulae, like the one in Andromeda that Hubble had observed, were in fact smaller objects inside the Milky Way itself. However, upon learning of Hubble's discovery, Shapley rapidly accepted that he was wrong and changed his mind. Hubble is also responsible for the second such shift that I wanted to mention. In 1929, he published a paper showing that these galaxies that he'd only discovered a decade earlier were actually all moving away from the Milky Way, and hence that the entire universe was expanding. Again, this was a huge change because the prevailing idea before this point was that the universe was stationary in a steady state for all of time. But the discovery of the expansion of the universe showed that the universe was actually growing in size, and that therefore, if you reverse the clock, the universe had to have a beginning. Again, this was an enormous claim, but Hubble provided very well-reasoned data along with the claim by measuring the distances to various galaxies using methods similar to that he'd used to discover the Andromeda galaxy, and then by measuring their recession speed using spectroscopy. The details don't really matter here. The important thing to take away is that this theory went against the strong consensus at the time, but Hubble overthrew that with a single study backed up with data. Within a couple of years, the world's top astronomers were trying to work out how to reconcile the equations of the universe that they'd been using with Hubble's new discovery, accepting that the equations were wrong and Hubble's data was undeniable. The third example is that of dark matter. Now, although Hubble had showed a great many extraordinary things in the universe, it was still believed that most of the mass in the universe was contained within stars. After all, when you look out, stars are what you can see lots of. But then again, that's part of the problem. If there were some component of the universe that didn't emit light, then how would we see it in the darkness of space? Well, one way is to measure its gravitational attraction. And when astronomers did look at this, starting in the 1930s and ending with Vera Rubin, who conducted a number of studies in the 1970s, they noticed that there was very much more matter than we could see. Stars at the edges of galaxies were orbiting the galaxy far more quickly than they should be able to do, given the amount of mass that we could account for by looking at the light from stars. So there was clearly some extra mass there that we couldn't see. And this so-called dark matter is still an enigma to this day. We don't yet know exactly what it is, but the evidence is strong enough that we know that it does exist, and its existence was never really doubted. There were a few other contesting theories, but essentially dark matter has been undeniable since it was first discovered. More excitingly, it actually makes up about 85% of the matter in the universe. Many times over this course I've approached the idea of extraordinary claims, and what it would take to believe in one. The Galileo Gambit really comes down to the claim that scientists should be more willing to believe extraordinary claims because they could well be true. And often, if they were true, then the implications would be so exciting that it's worth taking the chance. If it were true that some keen amateur chemist, for example, had cooked up a cure for all cancers in his garage, then it would indeed be an extraordinary achievement and would revolutionise the entire world. Doesn't it make sense to pay attention to claims like this because of their possible impact? Note that there are a few things that I want to point out before we go any further. Firstly, not every extraordinary claim is false. Many of the claims that I've outlined in this lecture were certainly extraordinary and yet have been borne out by scientific investigation. Also, it's worth pointing out that just because a claim doesn't have any positive evidential support, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. Let's say I go out in town tonight and end up sharing a few drinks with a famous film star at my local pub. That may well happen, extraordinary though it will be. But if I forget to take any pictures, however, I wouldn't blame my friends for refusing to believe the story. Anyone who's ever given the familiar reply, pictures or it didn't happen, knows exactly what scientific scepticism is all about, at least in this regard. But be careful to distinguish between there is no positive evidence for a claim and there is evidence against a claim. 
if my story were that I shared a drink with Charlie Chaplin or Marilyn Monroe, then there's not just no evidence in favour of that claim, but there is also substantial evidence against it, namely that they're both dead, so unlikely to be frequenting my local pub. What does an extraordinary claim actually mean? In the terms outlined in this course, an extraordinary claim is one with a very low Bayesian prior. Please refer to earlier lectures for more information on this concept. If a claim has a low Bayesian prior, then that means that, when taking into account everything we know about the universe, this claim is extremely unlikely to be true. Bayes' theorem then tells us how to add new evidence into this equation and adjust our view of the likelihood that this claim is true accordingly. So think of the prior as the chance that you would give such a claim of being true just before the person making the claim starts to put forward his or her argument. At this point, we're expecting one thing only. Evidence. An evidence of such impressive quality that it overcomes this prior. This means we require evidence that fits very well with the claim and doesn't match well with the predictions of any of the other more plausible explanations. That is, any explanation with a higher prior. Those two components are enshrined in Bayes' famous formula. The effect of the new evidence is the support term. But what Bayes' formula doesn't mention is the impact of a claim being true. We should be more interested in investigating claims if they have a high impact than if they have a negligible impact, and it seems reasonable that a highly important claim should overcome a slightly lower prior. For example, if someone claims to have cured cancer, that's clearly more important than if they claim to have flipped tails on a coin ten times in a row. I mean, who cares? But the important thing to realise here is that strong impact doesn't overcome any prior, no matter how low. We have to do a calculation here to see what the expected outcome of our investigation is. If someone claims to have cured cancer, and they want a million pounds to investigate that, then that's a big gamble. But even if they only have a one in a hundred chance of being right, then it's probably worth it. After all, for a large pharmaceutical company, that kind of money is peanuts, and the cure for cancer would be huge. But obviously, the sensible way to approach that would be to spend a smaller amount of money first, doing some preliminary investigations to see if we could get a better idea of whether the claim is likely to be true or false. However, if a claim has a prior of, say, one in a billion, then it doesn't really seem worth even doing the preliminary studies. The result may well be huge, but it's so unlikely to be true that it's not really worth considering investigating it. Think about it this way. If somebody offered you a wonderful deal, you put down £10 and spin a roulette wheel, and if the number you guess comes up, then you win a million pounds. That seems like a pretty good deal to me. You've got a 1 in 38 chance of winning a million pounds, and for a relatively small outlay. The expected outcome of any event is the probability of that event multiplied by the outcome. So in this case, I would expect to win a million pounds times 1 over 38, um, which is more than £26,000. But if the probability of winning was much lower, say there were four roulette wheels and I had to guess correctly on all of them, in that case there's a worse than 1 in 2 million chance of winning, meaning my expected winnings are only 50p. Similarly for the big pharmaceutical company, if they have to spend a relatively small amount of money on a 1 in 100 shot of curing cancer, then the expected gain is still vast. I mean, the amount of money you get from a medicine that could cure cancer is just huge. But if the claim isn't 1 in 100, but instead it's 1 in a million or 1 in a billion, then suddenly the expected gain becomes very, very small. Because remember, we're dividing by this, so it's 1 in a million, we're dividing by a million, or multiplying by 1 over a million. It just isn't worth spending money on something that's so incredibly unlikely to fail, especially when there are plenty of other things that you could be spending the money on instead. So is science closed-minded? What does it mean to be closed-minded? Is closed-mindedness a good thing in some cases? Well, being closed-minded is one of those insults that pseudoscientists throw at real scientists all the time. Oh, you're just closed-minded. You refuse to accept my claims because you're not willing to change your mind. Here's the thing. Closed-mindedness is a good thing in some cases. And of course, science is never fully closed-minded, but there's a limit to how long you can remain open to unbelievably implausible claims. For example, if someone claims that they're psychic and that they can read minds, and you thoroughly test them and prove that they have no such ability, of course, what would it take for you to spend your time testing them again? What should it take? Closed-mindedness is meant to be an insult, and the fact is that it's a bad thing to shut yourself off from any idea permanently, 
We should always be open to evidence if that ever arrives. But the great irony is that it's almost always the case that people who accuse scientists of being closed-minded are usually themselves the closed-minded ones. They refuse to accept the possibility that they might themselves be wrong. We're human beings. We have a small amount of time to spend investigating things that interest us, and often such investigations take money too, which is also in short supply. Those valuable resources are best spent working in the areas where they can expect the highest return. That is, those areas where a positive outcome is very likely and of high importance. So lots of money is being spent in various ways of curing cancer, or from nuclear fusion power, or electric vehicles. But nobody's spending much time investigating psychics, because we've done that. It's a claim which at one point may have had a moderately high prior, but then after repeated testing and finding out more about the universe, the likelihood of it being true in any sense has steadily plummeted, and now any psychic claim should be met with a prior exceptionally close to zero. Or, using a word that I use myself, zeroid. That is very, very close to zero, but not quite zero. Like the chance of you taking every coin in the world, flipping them all and getting heads on every single one of them. Something like that. Using a word like xeroid is a good way of defeating the standard pseudoscientist tactic of special pleading that we looked at in the last lecture. That is, when a scientist states the honest truth that no empirical claim has zero probability, there's always a tiny slimmer of logical possibility remaining. Then the dishonest pseudoscientist abuses the scientist's honesty and attempts to manipulate that into sounding like the pseudoscientific claim actually has some plausibility. So does all of this mean that I'm closed-minded towards psychics? Well, maybe it does. The thing about a closed mind, like a closed door, is that it can be opened at any point by someone with the correct key. In my case, the key I'm waiting for is sufficiently good quality evidence. I'm certain that it will never arrive, but if it ever does, then my mind will definitely open once more to learn something new and exciting about the universe. So what should the budding Nobel Prize winner do if they want to get their theory accepted by mainstream science? Given that science is often slow to change and resistant to implausible theories, for good reason, how can a brilliant young scientist persuade the scientific community to accept some revolutionary new idea? Well, the first step is to make sure that it's true. In fact, that's really the only step. It really isn't very complicated, I'm afraid. Scientists want two things in a claim. Evidence and plausibility. If your plausibility is very low, your Bayesian prior, then you need to make up for it with exceptionally good evidence. I think that the most important advice I can give here is this. There's no shame in being wrong, but there is shame in refusing to admit your mistakes and continuing to push a false idea in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. No idea is ever discarded forever, but if you find yourself defending a theory with something approaching the Galileo gambit, then I think it's probably a good time to temporarily shelve your idea until, or unless, at some point in the future, you can find evidence to show that it's true. Make sure you write down your claim so that you can prove you were the first to come up with the idea, of course. Don't worry, those nice Swedish people in the Nobel Prize Committee will give you your prize when the evidence comes in. But in the meantime, why not concentrate on discovering something else? Seriously, science is slow to change for a very good reason. But when we're building up a tower of knowledge, we need to make sure that every block in that tower is rock solid, because we're always building on top of it. Think about the process of evidence gathering and peer review rather like science's first-line immune system. These processes help to filter out as many bad studies as possible and make sure that incorrect ideas can't make it through to the accepted scientific literature, being a block in our tower, as it were. And of course, like the human immune system, sometimes something unwanted does get through. But we also have ways of dealing with that. The process of replication helps us to root out dodgy studies, because false claims are unlikely to get replicated by other researchers. So in this lecture we've discussed the Galileo gambit. That's the idea that history shows us that occasionally a valid idea is unfairly rejected, and that therefore we should bend a lot more effort investigating implausible theories on the off chance that they will turn out to be revolutionary. I think it should be obvious why this argument just doesn't work. There are two main reasons. Firstly, the claim that revolutionary ideas are all unanimously rejected by science just simply isn't true. Those that provided evidence were actually accepted rather quickly in general. 
However, we must remember that if we go back far enough, we're really talking about a society and a scientific process that didn't even vaguely resemble what we have today, and often ideas were accepted or rejected based on dogma rather than evidence. In today's scientific establishment, evidence and analytical argument are king. This is how modern science gets done. Secondly, it should be obvious that even if it were true that all great ideas were initially rejected, it doesn't follow that all rejected ideas are brilliant. In fact, quite the opposite. In order to filter through the vast array of ideas that are presented to the scientific community every year, we rely on a combination of Bayesian priors and the impact of the discovery to decide where to focus our efforts. And often that's an iterative process. We look into an idea a little bit, and if it's promising, then we spend the effort to look a bit further, but not before. If it gets less promising after our initial investigation, then we might reassess where to spend our time, and perhaps put that idea on the back burner, at least for now. So that's the end of this lecture. I hope you found it useful. Uh, if you enjoy these lectures and you think you know other people who may benefit from learning more about science, then please spread the word and get them out to as many people as possible. I'm hoping to release another one in a few weeks' time, so do subscribe to get the latest notifications. And if you have any suggestions for new videos, please let me know. Next time, I'll be talking about the subject of significance. What does it mean for a result to be significant? How should we approach preliminary studies, the kind of things you read in a newspaper, and the kind of sensational writing that we just see in the tabloid press? And what does it take to prove that your result is not just random chance? Thanks very much for your time.